the reduction and reuse of food waste, two subjects that are covered in an upcoming Quest television program, which is entitled From Farm to Fork to Fuel. The full TV show will be broadcast in our PBS partner markets in the coming weeks, and it will also be available online tomorrow on PBS Video. If you're following us on social media, uh, you'll be receiving a link for that. Um, our social media links are on our homepage at questscience.org. Uh, during this Hangout, we're, we're going to invite you, the audience, to also submit questions for anyone on our panel. Uh, and You can do that via the comments field on the Google Plus event page or using the hashtag, hashtag excuse me, Quest Food Fuel on Facebook, Twitter, or Google Plus. Um, before we get into our conversation, I'll give you a little bit of background information. My name is Lisa Landers, and I am the managing editor of Quest. Um, and before I introduce uh, Simran Sethi, who is going to be the moderator for today's conversation, um, I wanted to give you a few words about Quest. We are a National Science Foundation funded multimedia project that is focused on creating content that explores the science of sustainability with a focus on topics such as food, climate, water, uh, energy, and biodiversity. All Quest content is produced collaboratively by six stations, uh, six public media stations around the country who have boldly formed a partnership in order to create and distribute all of this content, which we do from, via web, radio, television, uh, and educational networks. Uh, with the launch of our new television series this month, it's our pleasure to have the host of this television series program and all of our programs, Simran Sethi, who is joining us today to moderate this discussion. Uh, a little bit about Simran, she was named the Environmental Messenger by Vanity Fair and a Top 10 Eco Hero of the Planet by the UK's Guardian. She is the former environmental correspondent for NBC News and has been featured on NBC Nightly News, CNBC, the Oprah Winfrey Show, the History Channel, and many other well-regarded programming venues prior to joining us here at Quest. Many thanks to Simran for joining us today all the way from Australia. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Lisa, thank you very much for that introduction. I, um, I am so honored to be involved with this project. and I'm here in Australia right now as an associate at the Melbourne uh, Sustainability Society Institute where I'm working on a book on the loss of agricultural biodiversity in food. And um, it's already the 15th here, and I can tell you it's, it's a great morning. Um, and, and what I'm, I'm so excited about is to introduce you to the people who will be speaking with you today. Um, Quest, the Quest Project and Quest Science is a sincere effort to engage people and explore innovative and transformative ways that we can sustain ourselves and our ecosystem. And as Lisa mentioned, today we're going to focus our conversation on some of the food-related subject matter that's featured in an upcoming episode of Quest called From Farm to Fork to Fuel. More specifically, we're going to talk about ways to reduce the 1.3 billion tons of food that are wasted each year and explore how one company in my home state of North Carolina uh, is turning food remains, cooking grease in particular, into biofuel that's being used to power the community. Um, I'm particularly excited because food is my passion and as I just mentioned I grew up in North Carolina so we have with us today some of the experts who are featured in this Quest episode as well as the terrific producers who created the television segments. Uh, first off, I'll introduce Dana Gunders, who's the staff scientist at NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council. And Dana works on market and policy-oriented initiatives to promote sustainability throughout food systems and supply chains. She leads NRDC's work on reducing food waste and is the author of the incredibly important uh, distributed report, Wasted, How America is Losing Up to 40% of Its Food from Farm to Fork to Landfill. Welcome, Dana. Thank um, you. You are so welcome. Um, the producer of the Food Waste segment is Shiraz Sadiq, who's a producer for Quest Northern California. Shiraz is an Emmy Award-winning KQED science producer who recently <coughs> received a National Science Journalism Award sponsored by the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And that was for a story that he produced about the seismic retrofit of the Hetch Hetchy water delivery system that's servicing the San Francisco Bay Area. So welcome, Shiraz, and thank you. Thank you for having me here today. 
Next, I'd like to introduce Lyle Estel, who's the president of Piedmont Biofuels. And Piedmont Biofuels is a small renewable energy company that produces biodiesel from cooking oil in central North Carolina. He's um, also an author, uh, the author of two books, including Biodiesel Power, The Passion, People, and Politics of the Next Renewable Fuel, and a brand new book that I'm hoping you'll tell us a bit more about. Welcome, Lyle. Thanks for having me. And finally, I'd like to introduce our Quest producer, David Huppert, who is a producer at Quest North Carolina. David produced the biofuel segment in this episode and also produced an incredibly inspiring piece on handcrafted denim in North Carolina that I've been sharing and watching very frequently. So thank you, David. So we have some questions nice that are ready to go. And um, just a reminder to the audience to please enter your questions and comments via the Google Plus interface, if you're watching us there, um, and via the hashtag QuestFoodFuel on Twitter, Facebook, or also on Google Plus. So um, let's jump into this conversation. Dana, I'm going to start with you. Globally, we throw away or lose about one third of food that's produced. And the Danish think tank, um, Concito, has worked on identifying hidden food loss or waste within the food sector to help people understand waste beyond the plate. Can you please elaborate, Dana, on where and how we waste food or lose food? Sure. Well, you know, unfortunately, it's happening all along the supply chain, really from farm to fork and beyond. Um, so any particular segment you look at, you'll find some amount of waste. If you start on the farm, we have waste uh, partially because of the cosmetics of food. So you'll think of the carrots you see in the store, for instance, are all perfectly straight. And yet, if you've ever grown carrots in your garden, you know sometimes they come out looking like a W or a P or any other uh, letter of the alphabet. And so all of those. Uh, fruits and vegetables that don't really come out cosmetically perfect wind up uh, often, unfortunately, in the trash. And as you move along the supply chain, you have similar uh, dynamics as as well, you know, with with the cosmetics of food, but also um, just the economics. Food has become a very inexpensive uh, part of any food business. In fact, often labor is a much more expensive part of running a food business. And so the decisions that are made are often maximizing the labor and not necessarily the use of the food. One thing I think is quite surprising to people is that this is a global phenomenon, that waste isn't just happening in developed countries or more developed countries, but also in developing countries. Can you explain a little bit more about how food is lost there as well? Sure. And, and to break it, to completely oversimplify it, um, many people will say that in the U.S. most of our food is lost kind of after the consumer gets it, whereas in developing countries it's really a problem of getting the product to market. And you don't see consumers um, really wasting food in the way that we do here. In fact, um, according to the FAO, the average person in North America as a consumer is wasting 10 times as much food as somebody in Southeast Asia, for instance. That, um, that, that statistic is staggering. And just for, for people's reference, FAO is the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Um, I read, Dana, in your blog post about how Americans feel about wasting food, and I'd love for you to flesh this out a little bit. You, um, you wrote that saving money seems to be the key thing on everyone's mind, actually, your exact quote. When asked what, if anything, they regret about throwing food away, 80% of people cited wasting money while only half felt bad that other people were hungry, and a mere 20% were worried about the waste of resources necessary to grow that food. But those embedded resources are critical. So can you, can you talk a little bit more about some of that waste that we don't see? And, and also if you think this idea of, of um, wasting food and, and thoughts around that are shifting as we, I don't know, as hunger becomes an issue that's more revealed in the United States or if you see any of this shifting. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, many people don't realize that here in the U.S., 
80% of our water consumption and over half of our land area are dedicated to agriculture. It's a huge resource investment, and when we're not eating that food, uh, really all of those resources go to waste along with it. And, and that's really sort of the environmental case to be made. Um, to, to bring it home, back to say your backyard barbecue, when you throw out a hamburger, that's the equivalent of taking a 90 minute shower in terms of the amount of water that was used um, to produce that product. So and food really is you know, a large resource uh, use case. And um, it's not something that people have in mind when they're when they're eating or tossing it. I, I do think that awareness ha has grown tremendously over the last few years. Um, the the problem has grown over the last say 30 or 40 years. Uh, in fact, we waste about 50 percent more now than we did in the 1970s per person. And over that time, I think we've become a little bit numb to it. And in these last few years, I think people have really um, responded a lot to the increased media attention that the issue is getting and um, we're seeing just all sorts of neat projects pop up where people are trying to, uh, you know, we have college students who are starting programs on their campuses to bring food to the hungry and we have people looking at how do we get those cosmetically imperfect carrots to people to eat them and so there's a lot of innovation in the space now, it's really exciting. That makes me so happy to hear, and I, I see some of that same innovation here in Australia, which um, which is really exciting and, and hopeful for me. Um, Shiraz, I wondered, the amount of food that we lose or waste is often contrasted the way I just did, which is against the number of people who are food insecure. I'm wondering, is there a direct connection, or have you found any research that shows, you know, as as Dana was just mentioning in terms of interesting initiatives, food being redirected um, to people who are hungry? Sure. Uh, you know, in the course of the production of my story, I was fortunate enough to come across an amazing food bank, and that food bank is Second Harvest here, uh, based in San Jose. And what it um, impressed on me is that I think food banks for you know, quite some time for many decades have been very effective at not only feeding hungry people but also rescuing food that perhaps would have gone to waste. So in the case of Second Harvest, when I was talking with the CEO, Kathy Jackson, she mentioned precisely that, that it's wonderful, you know, for us to be able to rescue food, but again, that's more of like the secondary mission. Um, in addition to Second Harvest, which, by the way, feeds 250,000 people every month in San Jose, I mean, it's absolutely astounding. And about 50% of the food that they give to the recipients is fresh produce. So, and the way that they're able to do that is because of a national initiative called From Farm to Family, whereby 140 million pounds um, of, I'm sorry, 100, I'm sorry, 140 tons of food, of produce is actually collected from growers, from farmers, and distributed to many different food banks throughout the nation, including uh, Second Second Harvest. So uh, that's an amazing resource, the food banks. In addition to Second Harvest in San Francisco, there's been uh, there's a there's a food charity by the name of Food Runners, and this is an organization which has been around since about 1987. And every week they they deliver t tons of food to uh, to charities, and they collect that food from grocery stores and from businesses. And uh, uh, you know nowadays we also have some really amazing online uh, initiatives and some startups. So I'm right now working on a Quest Web Extra about startups and uh, uh, startups and what they're doing to curb food waste. So there's a really successful one here in the Bay Area called Crop Mobster and uh, CropMobster.com and what's really great about Crop Mobster is that anyone, it doesn't have, you don't have to be a retailer, you don't have to be a business, you can be an individual, but you go onto the site and you basically register and then you're able to actually post alerts um, if, you're, if you're, for example, a, a grocer. Um, or if you're you're a farm, and you can tailor that so that, for instance, I'm going to give away 50 pounds of organic apricots, but only if you're um, a charity, a food relief charity, um, or if you're a farmer and you just want to sell some excess surplus produce, you can do so at discount, and that's been a huge success. The really amazing thing about Crop Mobster is this website launched in March by Nick Papadopoulos and his partners, Joanna and Gary Cedar, and in six months, 
they have helped rescue 40 tons of food in the Bay Area, which is astounding. And, you know, they're in nine counties. And as Nick Papadopoulos told me, he said, you know, we're rescuing food, but we're also helping to grow local farming communities. So there's been an attendant benefit with it as well. And then also in the Bay Area, there is another startup by the name of Food Shift, started by Dana Frost. And this is a great organization. They launched in January 2012, and they've worked now with the Oakland Unified School District. And they're also working with a retailer, Andronico's, um, which is also doing a tremendous job to reduce its food waste by partnering with another startup by the name of Food Star. So there are a lot of really exciting initiatives going on to crowdsource, if you will, uh, surplus food, um, and also to harness social media. These alerts, these crops and lobster alerts, they go out via Facebook, via Twitter, and that's a way by which to quickly galvanize the community and to send out these alerts and have them responded to within the matter of an hour sometimes. Uh, so it's a really terrific success story. It's also really exciting to me because it's, it's, um, it's participation in the informal economy. And I think that's what I also love about the promise of social media is we're seeing different app, you know, web applications or mobile applications for where people, like you said, can just say, I have this food, come and get it. And, and um, I've been looking at that particularly around urban foraging, which is really that movement is growing a lot here uh, in Australia and I know is growing in the Bay Area as well. Are there any um, apps that you think that people should maybe consider as they're looking for some of this food that might be available for them? Well, I was mentioning, for example, CropMobster. So right. I think anyone can go onto CropMobster.com and register and it's free right. to use CropMobster. Uh, my understanding is that Foodstar, Foodstar Partners, uh, dot com mm -hmm. is the is the website. They're working specifically at the retail level, uh -huh. and uh, with Food Shift, I believe that also right now they're working with organizations. So I mentioned the Oakland Unified School District, and I also right. mentioned you know they're working with another retailer, um, uh, Andronicos. I don't believe that they have an app, but Dana, do you know of any uh, startups which now have created apps um, to quickly send out alerts, you know, um, of of surplus food? Um, not alerts quite in that same way, but there are, I mean, there's a website called fallenfruit.org. You mentioned urban foraging, and that's a really neat website where you can go into your community and see where there's public uh, fruit trees uh, that you might find fruit at. Um, there are a lot of apps to help people waste less food, and, and those come in the form of uh, you know, apps to help you figure, remember what's in your refrigerator and remind you uh, of when it's gonna be, you know, expired or, or near expired. Um, there are apps that help you figure out what to cook. So if you have a bunch of leftovers or, or you know, if you, a little of this, a little of that, and you're trying to figure out what to make for dinner, you can put in the different ingredients and um, it'll pop up what you might want to cook for dinner. That, um that sounds incredibly promising and I'm very glad to hear it, especially as I'm sitting here in Australia where about 20% of food is wasted and along with green matter, food waste here comprises half of landfill waste and is the second largest contributor of methane which is of course one of the most potent of greenhouse gas emissions that contributes to climate change. And, and with that I'd like to um, transition over to Lyle and Piedmont Biofuels and, and David to talk a little bit about climate change and and that is certainly one of the reasons that we're seeking out alternative fuel sources so Lyle I'd like to I ask you to tell us a bit more about Piedmont biofuels and what inspired you to get involved with this method of fuel production well Piedmont biofuels is a community scale biodiesel plant in Pittsburgh North Carolina that's a small town of about 4,000 and we're on the edge of uh, region that's called the Research Triangle Park. That's Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill. And what we do is we aggregate fats, wastes, and oils that we collect from pretty much about 50 miles from around our plant and we convert them into biodiesel. And biodiesel is a cleaner burning renewable fuel that can go into any diesel engine without uh, modification. So we have a small co-op of about 400 members that are driving around on cars and trucks that are powered by 100% biodiesel that are made from that, that is made from the uh, the food waste that we bring home. 
So um, thank you. Uh, tell us a little bit more about this actual process of transforming cooking grease into fuel. Um, I'm imagining it's quite labor intensive, but I'm curious as to what you actually, the expert, have to say about this. Uh, well, we are we are a chemical plant, and so what we're doing is we're chemically modifying the the grease to make it into a um, product that is compatible with with diesel engines. So, what is our plant? It's uh, we have a one million gallon per year operation, and it's about moving liquids around. So, trucks are coming in and dropping off product, and they might be a vacuum truck that's full of uh, you know fifteen hundred gallons of liquid, or it might be an eighteen wheeler that has a whole bunch of barrels on it, or comes at us in all sorts of shapes and form. Some of it as a solid, so we have to heat it up and render it into a liquid form before it becomes usable. And so that's part of the plant. And then in the middle of the plant, we have our reactors and our tanks and our our washing and our drying facility. And then the final part of the plant is uh, the distribution side, where the biodiesel goes back into the world. It goes onto trucks and gets delivered to down down farmers lanes and out to uh, what we call the B100 community trail. And we also sell it to oil companies where it gets blended into lower percentage blends like B20 or B2 or something like that. Thank you. David, okay, so in your research, Lyle just said that any diesel engine can run on biodiesel. Tell me a little bit more about the consumer side of this and what you've learned and how um, more people might be able to start availing of these fuels. Sure, it would be my pleasure. Um, first, I just want to clarify what Lyle said. Uh, it's true. There are chemical company, but they do not they do not look like a chemical plant. It's more of like a page out of a Dr. Seuss book. In fact, it is on Lorax Lane, and you go to this, they call it the plant where they make this biodiesel, and there's a huge farm that engulfs the whole area with solar double cropping and wildlife corridors and butterfly bushes that are three stories high, and everything is intentionally crafted there to extract as much from the earth and give back as much as possible. And when there's a spill at their plant, uh, no one freaks out. It's okay. It's all bio. It's all biodiesel and natural products that uh, they can contain. So it is the chemical plant, but it doesn't smell like a plant. Doesn't look like a plant. You'd be forgiven for thinking that it was just a bunch of hippies running around trying to uh, power their own tractors, but in turn, they actually are powering a whole community. So it's uh, it's a plant and and a lot more on top of that. Uh, back to your question, though, Simran, in terms of what does it take to power your vehicle, or how do you have to modify it? I think Lyle got frustrated with me the fifth or sixth time I said, okay, I know you've said this before that you don't have to modify this car, but just lift up the hood and show me where you modified this engine to run this B100. And he looked at me after the fifth time and said, this does not make for very good TV because there's nothing to show you. I didn't, there's no modifications here. You just put it in and go. And that was my experience with researching this piece and talking to other folks. It gets interesting because mechanics will tell you and certain government websites will tell you that there needs to be slight modification in certain temperatures to run B100, uh, which is 100% biodiesel. But Lyle has educated me and pointed me to, to the literature that says that, in fact, manufacturers cannot void your warranty for putting biodiesel in there. That is your choice, and there's a law to protect you from that. So it's fair game to just to fill up and go. And Lisa challenged me on this as well. She has a Jetta. Sorry to call you out on it, but Lisa wanted to know, can I use this uh, biodiesel in my TDI? And I told her, go for it, because I've seen the cars that have done it, and they have hundreds of thousands of miles on it. So it's fair game. It's uh, You're able to use it on the consumer level without modifying your engine at all. Game on, man. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I just think we all wanted to hear again that like we could do this. And I... I mean, this might seem like a naive question, but why? And I open this up to everyone. But why aren't we? What What is the What is the greatest barrier to actually getting people to use this technology? I think the greatest barrier is limited feedstocks. So when the biodiesel industry in America was born, it sort of came to us from the soybean industry. And in fact, our plant, when it opened, used virgin soybean oil. So the beans would be grown down on the coastal plain of North Carolina, shipped up to Raleigh, 
crushed into an oil and would come into our plant on 18 wheelers. When soybean oil became cost prohibitive as a biodiesel feedstock, we switched over to poultry fat and we ran about 1.3 million gallons of poultry fat through our plant. When poultry fat became cost prohibitive as a biodiesel feedstock, we switched over to what we're on now, which is waste. So we're on scraps and cooking oil and fats that have already been used. And I think that that is the, that is the limiting factor. I think it's probably over for virgin sources of biomass for biofuels. And that means that I think not everybody's TDI can run around on it because there just is not enough waste, fats, oils, and greases to power this big wasteful economy. That sounds like a contradiction, but I, I get what you're saying. Um, there's another thing that I've heard that is a, sounds like a bit of a contradiction, which I'd love for you to clarify, Lyle. I've been told that you purposely price biodiesel higher than the cost of petroleum. Can you elaborate? Well, we do charge more than petroleum. First of all, I need to put this in context. We are very, very small. So we are a 1 million gallon per year biodiesel plant. North Carolina burns 4 million gallons worth of diesel fuel a day. You know, I had Norfolk Southern call me up the other day. They're a big railroad uh, company over here. They also burn 4 million gallons a day. And what I told them was, you know, if I had a 1 million gallon tank, which I don't, and if I had a year's worth of work, which I don't, you know, I could run Norfolk Southern from 9 until 5, and they would need another supplier after that. So the, the notion of product availability, we're, we're not really trying to displace all the petroleum in the world. We do charge more than our, uh, you know, our petroleum counterpart. And, of course, our product is also vastly superior. So it's a premium product over petroleum. We're, we're better from an emissions standpoint, and we're better from a, you know, there, there's no war required to make biodiesel, and we've got a big long list. We, we don't contribute as much to climate change and so on and so forth. So it's, it is more valuable than petroleum fuel, without a doubt. It's a premium product, and we charge a premium price for that. And plus, if we ever wanted to be cheaper than petroleum diesel, all of our output would get wiped out in the first five minutes of the day. Well, That's and I think what you're are. pointing to is also that we in the United States don't actually pay the full price, and what you're suggesting is like there's a lot more that goes into this, and that that should be considered by the consumer as well. Subsidies really distort the price of so many things, and I think the minute you leave the United States, you recognize that the the price we pay for petroleum is actually quite low and is not revealing the full cost. So thank you for clarifying, and um and I want to just touch on you you mentioned small. Tell us a little bit more. About about. You're on a book tour right now. Tell us a little bit more about your book and, and the message that you're bringing to people. So this is my fourth book, and it's called Small Stories, Big Changes, Agents of Change on the Front Lines of Sustainability. And it is a, it's an anthology. It has 14 different chapters by 14 different activists, and some of them are, have been pioneers in wind, some of them have been pioneers in green building, etc. And it's... Uh, a collection of stories that um, were out running around doing these sort of salon discussions um, with people and um, it's quite interesting. I would say it's largely a book about activism and it's been a lot of fun. That um, That's incredibly inspiring and I, I love that idea of like these are small efforts and that's kind of coming through I think in this conversation that that these small efforts in aggregate are what lead to transformation. Whether it's um, the 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 website that tells you where to come and and pick up you know wasted food, or the one that tells you how to cook, or you know that that there's there are these ways to come together and work collectively to to manifest the change that we want. So I um I wonder I I would love to open this up to social media as well. Um and I see a question coming in. Uh and thank you all so much for all of your insights. Uh, so far. Um, the question is, so, uh, is it true that a gallon of biofuel does not get as many miles per gallon as a gallon of unleaded gas? So I'm guessing this is for David or Lyle. So the, the energy density is what determines your miles per gallon and the energy density of a gallon of biodiesel is about the same as the energy density as a, as a gallon of petroleum diesel. So in the case of diesel, you're going to go about the same distance on a gallon of fuel. 
That is not true for ethanol. So ethanol is a replacement for gasoline, and a gallon of ethanol has lower BTUs or lower energy density, and so you will see your mileage taking a hit if you're replacing gasoline with ethanol. Does that make sense? There are two different kinds of biofuels. Biodiesel, you're fine. Ethanol, you're going to see your mileage drop. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, to that point, one of the things that we're certainly seeing is, um, again, as a response to feeding a hungry planet, is looking toward waste as a primary source of biofuel, Lyle, as you were mentioning, rather than um, using virgin lands or cropland to grow fuel. Um, do you see, David, in your research, an increase in that happening? Are there other examples that, that you can point to that are similar to what you see happening with, with, um, with Lyle and his, his organization? Sorry, you cut out there for a quick second. I think I missed the uh, question. Can you repeat that for us? Sorry, Bill? I'm going to blame it on being in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, my question uh, is, we see now um, a greater concern in, in, in research around using marginal lands to grow food or to also grow or raise feedstocks for fuel. And I'm, I'm wondering, I really appreciated what Lyle was saying when he made the distinction that he started off with virgin soybeans and has now moved to waste as a feedstock. And I wondered if you're seeing that happen, in, you know, that, that movement growing toward this or if any of that came up in your research. Are you able to pick any okay, of that up? I think up, I Dave? caught uh, enough of the question to sort of weigh in here. So if I'm taking it in a direction, yeah. Well, I'll just toss it to you, Lyle, in a second. And that um, I think the exciting frontier in biofuels, as I've seen so far, is really what they're doing at Piedmont with this uh, in regards to enzymes. So right now, my understanding is that they can take grease that let's say let's call it 50%. It's yellow grease, so it's the used vegetable oil from deep fryers, and it's what you see when you're doing. Hey, I'm going to jump in because we're all having trouble hearing you, David, and you've suddenly gotten totally pixelated. So um, I'm, we're going to cut you off, maybe come back to you and go to Lyle just to pick up where you're, you've left off. Sorry about that. So I, I, I didn't get all of that, but um, he was talking about the enzymatic catalysis that we developed, and the concept of using enzymes is in part to allow us to use crummier and crummier feedstocks. So right now when we're collecting oil from the back of a restaurant or when we're buying waste from say a makeup company or or perhaps we're buying the dregs from a nutraceutical company, we're constantly trying to procure product that has is low in free fatty acids. And that's where the biodiesel industry is today. We're pretty much limited to you know, what we would call the good stuff. But if you look at fat soils and greases on a spectrum, you'll find that there are a lot of uh, products like um, trap grease that's already gone down the drain or um, fat soils and greases out of the sewer system or there, there's a, a wide variety of uh, greases that the biodiesel industry does not avail itself of now. And so part of our work with enzymatic catalysis is to try to let us get at that supply. And again, you know, waste is a human invention. The only thing that makes waste waste is that you can't sell it for something, right? When something costs you to get rid of it, it is a waste. And the minute someone gives you a penny for it, it becomes a commodity. So today, we do have a lot of waste fats, oils, and greases. And I would say that 10 years from now, those will all be commoditized and they will all be getting used up and deployed. We've been making biodiesel now at Piedmont since 2002, and we've certainly seen that happen in our region. We used to go to a restaurant and knock on the front door and they'd say, help yourself, take as much as you want. You know, come back and get some more, weirdo. And uh, nowadays they say, um, uh, you know, nowadays the, con the dumpsters are locked and they're watertight and they're under contract. And we have a state law that, you know, makes it a felony to touch someone else's grease. So I would say that the same trajectory will happen to crummier fat soils and greases in the future. 
Thank you. We have another question coming in, and this is for Dana and Shiraz. Um, the question is, what are the top ways an individual can contribute to stopping food waste? I can take that. Um, well, there's so much we can be doing, and it, of course, starts in our own kitchens, um, actually really in the grocery store, because we commit ourselves to the food that we have in the grocery store, and then we go about our weeks, and sometimes they go as planned, but often they don't, and I think we all, many of us get to the grocery store and a little bit unrealistic about what we are actually going to consume that week. Um, so I think planning for um, actual meals before you go to the grocery store, sticking to a list. Those are great habits to get used to that really can lead to less waste. Um, also being creative in our kitchens and, and trying to use up what we have um, with whatever concoction we can come up as well. And buying those slightly cosmetically off products can really send a signal. Um, you know, an apple that may have a little scar on it or something like that. When we as consumers are willing to buy those, then the stores will be willing to sell them, and that will lead to less waste upstream. The last thing I'll say is that we can all use our freezers much better. I feel like our freezers are vastly underutilized, and um, we should be, be making better use of those. I'd love to I'd just, love to just jump, jump, jump in for, for oh, sorry, a sorry, quick, quick moment. moment. Uh, I think Shiraz uh, all would jump in. Go ahead. Go ahead. Who's got, Who's got it? Shiraz, Shiraz I think you've got it. We'd love, love to hear your, your um, um, any, any insights you have to add to Dana's if you have them. Sure. sure. So, so Dana, Dana was mentioning how, how maybe if maybe consumers, consumers express a greater, greater desire, desire to uh, purchase, purchase that, that produce that isn't perfect, that maybe that could also have, have an impact. And that's something, that's something that, that I've just seen in the course of my research. My research. When, when I contacted Andronico's and when we were filming there, Andronico's is a market here in the Bay Area. Well, what we were able to do is we went there for one of the flash sales that they were having. And they were and they actually were having, having a flash sale, sale of cosmetically flemish produce, produce, which they, which do, they do three times, three times a week. And they, and they sent, sent out that blast about that flash sale via Facebook and, and uh, via an email, email alert. alert. So, so I think, like, you know, you the know, more people, people expressing their interest for buying that nutritious and slightly flemish produce, I think that would have an impact. And I think also, a better, better understanding, understanding what those, those used by, by best before, before and sell by sell dates by mean, mean on, on packaging, packaging that could that have could a have huge impact because that, that was one of the things, one of the things that was most, most illuminating to me is the understanding, the understanding that, that those dates, dates really have really nothing have to do with food safety. safety. They're really about food quality. quality. And I think and I so many of us mistakenly throw out, let's say, that box of granola bars because, oh, look, expired and I eat it, I'm going to get sick. Well, in fact, that's not the case. Dana, do you have anything you'd like to add on that point? Yep, sorry, just unmuting myself here. Um, absolutely, and thanks for bringing that up, Shiraz. Um, a, a big contributor to the amount of food that we're wasting uh, is our misinterpretation of those dates on food. And just like Shiraz said, many people, in fact, about 9 out of 10 Americans uh, are misinterpreting the dates on food to be about food safety when in fact they're not. Um, they really are about the food's quality. They were never intended to be about safety. It's always been about indicating the food's freshness. And so, you know, just trying, I, I think it's really hard for people to hear that because many people have kind of lived their whole lives throwing the yogurt out right on the date. Um, but in fact, the yogurt can be good several weeks that date as long and, and much more important to the food safety is really um, keeping it and storing it properly. So making sure that it's cold um, and refrigerated for those products that need to be refrigerated and then making sure that you don't go on three other errands after you go to the grocery store and let everything sit in a hot car. That's much more important to safety um, and freshness actually than the dates themselves. I think what you're saying is like, like use your senses. senses. I mean, we can <laughs> we smell can things and look at them and make some pretty good estimates ourselves. It's true. Yep. You'll smell or taste that things are bad long before they would make you sick. 
Thanks. <laughs> As someone who smelled my milk this morning, um, we have another question coming in on social media, and this is uh, for Lyle. Lyle, what does uh, Piedmont Biofuels pay for a gallon of waste grease? Okay, so it depends on the quality. So if we can get low free fatty acids, that's more valuable to us than product that has been degraded. But I would say that, uh, and the market goes up and down, so we are tied to global commodity markets, whether we like it or not. And so I would say that we would range anywhere from as low as 50 cents to as high as $3 a gallon for the um, fat, soils, and greases that we collect. And, you know, there's a, a wide quality spectrum there. That's, um, you bring up, while wow, such an important point that in this kind of era of globalization that we really, a lot of these decisions are made outside of our communities. And I wonder if, um, I would love to hear from all of the panelists what you think about sort of a, how a move toward local can improve the areas that, that you're working on. So in regards to food waste or, um, or fuel distribution or fuel usage, if there's, if there's anything to kind of looking to more local solutions. Uh, I can try. I can try that one if you want. Or go ahead, Dana, if you want. Uh, sure. Um, well, from a, a a food waste perspective, I think local has a lot to offer for improvements, and, and likely already is. I mean, starting with what we've been talking about around cosmetic imperfections. When you go to the farmers market, people have a much higher tolerance for for cosmetically imperfect fruit, and therefore farmers are able to sell that much more of what they grow because of it. I also think the direct relationships that form in a local economy really allow for people to absorb surplus and crop mobster that um, Shiraz was mentioning before is a good example of that. You know, that would that would not work on a national scale unless you had refrigerated trucks and things like that, but on a local scale, you're really able to post, hey, I have you know, three cartons of extra tomatoes, does anybody want them? And um, certainly, I'm sure there are plenty of takers for most of those options. Um, something that really can only work on a smaller scale. Shiraz, Shiraz, is there anything you'd like to add to that? I completely concur with Dana. I think it was am amazing just to see the initiatives which are happening at a local level um, and also with local retailers. So I mentioned Adronico's, but there's also Buy Right Market here in San Francisco, and they have been working with Crop Mobster. In fact, uh, Nick Papadopoulos, his farm, he's one of the co-founders of, of Crop Mobster. He has a local farm, and that farm um, is one of the suppliers for Buy Right's amazing produce. So I think it's wonderful when you can find some synergies at the local level between the retailer and the grower, and when you have also a community of some really tech-savvy people, and it also helps that we're here in the, you know, in Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is not far from San Francisco, and that's a hub of innovation, and it's nice that that innovation is now continuing when it comes to trying to take, come to trying to take a bite out of food waste. Thank you. I know it was a, a bit of a clunky question, but David, you've done a, a, a lot of beautiful work on, on local initiatives, and I wonder, do you think, do you think there's anything to lo the local model when it comes to fuel procurement as well? Well, sure. I think that it's, it's a good question, and at the end of the day, you just have to, you're going to have to pay a premium if you want to support local, uh, at least until it ramps up to a point where local can compete. But a lot of people are price shopping for the cheapest way or the cheapest fuel or the cheapest food or the cheapest whatever. And if it's important to you uh, to support a local community, then you have to actually put your money where your mouth is. You have to walk the walk. And at a certain level, uh, the prices should be competitive. But we talked earlier about some of the subsidies that big industry gets, agriculture and fuel and so on. So it's really hard for the little farmer, the little producer to compete with that. So as a member of a community, you have to ask yourself some serious soul-searching questions. Do I believe in this? And if so, how much am I willing to pay for it? We all like driving by farms on our way somewhere instead of whatever else. But, you know, those are people that live on those farms. And to pay lip service doesn't quite do it, and I'm not trying to preach here because I'm certainly guilty of, you know, going even to the supermarket and the co-op and everything and not buying everything local. Uh, Lyle's an inspiration for that. I mean, Lyle, are you still on your 100-mile diet? Are you still rocking that out when you're, when you're in Pittsburgh? Um, 
but even Lyle at a book reading the other day said something that was uh, really sort of grounding and you know I remember you were reading from this book and then you held out your cell phone and you said you know I can't live without this this is a this is my lifeline for my business so we all make concessions so on balance I think we just have to really be honest with ourselves and if we want this type of community then we have to support it and uh, put our money down towards it and there's so many opportunities as, as you've heard on this panel to do that so we just have to make choices that we're comfortable with and that we can afford and the more people do that the more buy-in we have the cheaper it'll get and the economies of scale will start to work in our favor and, and you're so, speaking to like the most important I think part of this which is relationships so I want to just on um, in that theme um, take the opportunity to see if any of you on the panel have questions for any of your fellow panelists um, sure um, for I think Dana um, Natural Resources Defense Council has sort of had a national policy of being anti-biofuels and my understanding is that that policy is under review because of the roundtable on sustainable biomaterials out of Switzerland is there do you know anything about that or have you been following that at all I know that uh, uh, the Sierra Club seems to have budged what about um, NRDC yikes I'm severely unqualified to speak about that um, you know, I know we we certainly have been really fighting against the first generation, but you know, ethanol, corn ethanol generation of biofuels, and that's something that um, I don't think we would change our views on because it's really led to uh, you know higher corn prices, which have led to Con conserved lands being ripped out and, and things like that. So I think you know that's something that we believe fairly strongly on. Um, second generation biofuels, I mean I think what you're doing sounds fantastic and that's certainly not um, a place where we would tend to be opposed to. Uh, one of the things I get concerned about, you know, one another destination for wasted food that's really kind of hot and new and, and building now is um, anaerobic digestion. It's not for fuels, it's really for um, energy production, like for electricity. But um, in the UK, they've kind of overbuilt their infrastructure for that, and they now are growing crops just to put them into their anaerobic digesters, where they originally saw it as an option to absorb and sort of divert their food waste from landfills and make good use of it. And so I think we need to be careful about um, just designing things to be sized appropriately so that we're not spending a lot of capital investing in things in kind of monsters that we need to feed in ways that may not be the most efficient to feed them in the future. Um, but and so that's kind of where we you know from the big picture we get hesitant. Um, but for things that are truly waste, I think it's a fantastic thing to take that product, take it out of a landfill, get the energy out of it, and then for some of these technologies, even once the energy has been taken out of it, you can even um, still capture the nutrients and use them on farms. I mean, I, I think, mean, I think scale, scale is, is the deal, deal, without a, without doubt. a doubt. And so, so in, in our, our view, view, the next, the next 100 million, million gallons, gallons of fuel, fuel should, should not, not come, come from, from a 100, 100 million, million gallon, gallon plant, plant in the harbor, harbor, but rather, rather should come should from, from 100. 100 little plants little like plants ours are, that are distributed are just, yeah. and, located and located on waste streams. Mm -hmm. I'd be thrilled to see that. <laughs> I have a question, have a question for, for Lyle and David. David. I'm, curious I'm curious to know, to know if... if oh, I'm sorry. Please go ahead. Sorry, this is Shiraz here. I have a question for Lyle and David. I'm curious to know if you, um, how Europe and Canada, uh, other parts of the world are doing with respect to biofuel usage? Well, I would say that um, the United States is probably behind Europe in the form, in, in terms of biodiesel development. Um, I would say that we probably are comparable to Canada or, you know, as is always the case, our industry would be, say, ten times larger than theirs. But um, I would say that, uh, you know, 
th there are community scale biodiesel projects all over Canada and the United States. Uh, but in aggregate, they're small in terms of their contribution to um, North America's energy mix. Lyle, can you um, elaborate? Sorry. Lyle, one oh. of the things that we talked about was that a lot of the biofuel plants go offline very quickly because they can't get over that hump of trying to make it work after about seven or so years, right? Well, how do you think you guys were able to sustain that first wave and not go offline like you've seen so many other great initiatives, unfortunately, uh, haven't been able to sustain themselves for that crucial startup period? Yeah, there's no doubt that the history of the American biodiesel industry is is littered with lots of dead bodies, and lots of projects get built and never get turned on, and lots of projects get shuttered or sold for scrap. So it has not been a good place for investment uh, over the past decade, and it's been a very tough space. The thing we have to realize is that we're not inoculated from global commodity markets, and we are... Uh, uh, we're also at the whim of the policy layer. So energy pricing is a function of policy. This country still doesn't have an energy policy. And so we are kind of bumbling along not knowing where we want biodiesel in our energy mix. So one year you get a dollar and the next year you don't. And so plants open and plants close. Um, projects get built and people go bankrupt. And it's um, it's sort of been like that. Uh, we have a, a pretty good policy on petroleum, right? We've got, you know, we'll go fight wars to make sure that we get it cheaply, but we don't have anything of the kind for biodiesel. Does anyone else have any questions, or can I jump back in? Well, we're nearing the end of our chat, so my my actually my questions are for my my journalist comrades, I wonder, David, if you could tell me, um, in interviewing Lyle, what surprised you most about what you've learned about biofuels? Well, I guess um, it, the answer goes back to a question that you asked earlier about what can we do to support local communities. And when I was interviewing Lyle at one point, we were standing in the biodiesel factory, which is right next to a farm, and I said, uh, how much of a leap is it to get involved with local food from where you are with local fuel? And Lyle said, it's really about one step away. One thing informs the next. So it is one, another facet of investing in our fuel economy and our fuel infrastructure is just another way of investing in our community to make ourselves independent and to be self-reliant and I never thought of it that way I thought these these are levers that are being pulled by forces that are way out of our control so I've known Lyle for years and I've seen the project grow and grow over these years and I never realized how connected it was to community and how connected it is to our food sources so it's really choices it's about choices that we have about as consumers where we're gonna spend our money and it's choices that we have in terms of entrepreneurs like Lyle do we want to invest in this community and how much of a change are we gonna make in the big scheme of things, and does that even matter? And what surprised me the most was that Lyle, uh, and I don't want to speak for Lyle, but my understanding is that Lyle said, it doesn't matter. We're not trying to take down Exxon or Mobil or BP. We're trying to power this small community, and that's as much as we're trying to do, and we hope that we inspire other communities to do the same. And at that point, I thought, great, we got that on camera, we got a great soundbite, and we've got a great story, so <laughs> keep on talking. <laughs> And great inspiration <laughs> beyond the story. That's fantastic. Shiraz, was there anything that really jumped out or surprised you as you were working with Dana and doing your, your research and putting the piece together? Yes. Well, I think, firstly, the sheer scale of the problem. I wasn't aware that in the U.S. we waste 40% of the food that we produce, that this amounts to about $165 billion. And also, equally as sobering, if not more so, that more than 50% of the produce that we grow goes to waste, mainly because it doesn't meet exacting standards of size or aesthetics. You know, it, the, that produce might be cosmetically blemished. So I think that was really sobering. Um, and the other thing which I thought was also really interesting is learning that, you know, for food waste, we all have a stake. You know, it's not... And it's an issue that cuts across ethnic lines, along political lines, 
And the other really great thing about food waste is that it's a problem that, you know, again, everyone can get around. So when we have these stores which are selling cosmetically blemished produce, you know, they're not just doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. Um, there is some money that they're making, and I think the proof is in the pudding. You know, they're selling that produce at like 80% uh, off, and people are showing up and they're buying it. So that creates a win-win scenario. So I think it was really wonderful to find out that, okay, it's a huge problem, but there are some novel efforts currently underway to tackle the immensity of this problem. And I also just wanted to rectify something I said earlier when I was talking about this national program from farm to family whereby California growers and other grow growers, uh, farmers throughout the U.S. are giving some of that cosmetically blemished produce to the um, to the food banks, it's 140 million pounds. So I just wanted to clarify that. I think I might have stumbled over that statistic. Thank you so much. This has been such an inspiring conversation. Lisa, I turn it back to you, but I'm just, I'm so happy for what I've learned and what you've shared and, and feeling agency, like we all have a role to play in, in making the system better. So thanks. Thanks from Melbourne, Australia. <laughs> Thank you, Simran, and thanks to everybody. This was a wonderful, lively conversation. Um, I learned a lot. I hope everybody else did too. Um, and uh, again, I want to reiterate that um, you can learn more about Piedmont bio Biofuels and and take a tour, go behind the scenes at uh, at his plant at Lyle's plant. Uh, you can learn more about food waste uh, with Dana as she, as she tours a a dump site filled with food that seems like could have been eaten um, as part of our television show from farm to fork to fuel which also includes another segment which is about uh, actually cultivating food on a local level in inner city Milwaukee uh, so it's a really great mix of shows we hope you'll tune in once again um, that show is available or will be available tomorrow at uh, PBS video uh, you'll get a link to that if you are following us on social media you can uh, sign up for to follow us on social media by checking out our website, questscience.org. And we hope you will come and look at these stories, look at these videos, and take a look at some of the other stories that uh, are, are coming through right now on our site. So thank you again and to all of our panelists and to all of those of you who are out there in the audience. I uh, hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Thanks for having me.